Welcome back to What Happens Next, the podcast that examines some of the biggest challenges facing our world and asks the experts, what will happen if we don't change? And what can we do to create a better future? I'm Dr. Susan Carland. Keep listening to find out what happens next. Loneliness has reached epidemic proportions in Australia, but a local community app is working to overcome the problem. Care. Loneliness has become an ec- epidemic in this country. Research shows it can have a bigger impact on health than cigarette yeah, really smoking. Really tough time for a lot of people. This comes as academics suggest we're facing a loneliness epidemic. In fact, studies show that feeling lonely is a bigger risk for premature death. Than in last week's episode, we looked at some of the reasons why more people are reporting problematic levels of loneliness. Catch up now on part one if you missed it. In today's episode, I'm talking to experts about whether or not the increasing awareness of the issue of loneliness will lead to action. And what can we do to address it anyway? It's not as simple as just being friendly to everyone on the street. Today, we'll find out some of the ways researchers, policymakers, and community leaders are tackling loneliness. We mentioned last week that some countries, including the UK and Japan, are attempting to address loneliness with increased government support and policies. Does Australia need a Minister for Loneliness too? And what exactly would that entail? Here's Labor's federal member for Scullin, Andrew Giles. Hi, I'm Andrew Giles. I'm the federal MP for Scullin. I represent a, a reasonable chunk of the northern suburbs of Melbourne in the federal parliament. And I'm the spokesperson for cities and for multicultural affairs. What do they do? What does a Minister for Loneliness oversee? I think in the UK, I'm more familiar with the, uh, the experience in the UK and I've had a, a little bit of dialogue with, uh, um, I think, current, although she may have, They've had a reshuffle there, Bar- Baroness Baron, which I thought is, a, is the sort of name you remember. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in, in the UK, I think that the role really uh, reflects, uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, an awareness that if government has responsibility to respond to loneliness, it, it's got to be about pulling together um, the things that government does rather than building a new silo. And as I understand it, and I've had the opportunity to have, as I say, some, some dialogue with the, one of the UK ministers, it's about pulling together an awareness of the programs government does, the information government um, holds, and applying that to this problem, working with civil society. Uh, and and uh, as I also understand it, I think a similar process is being followed in Japan, but the appointment of the minister there is, is very much early days. But having a mechanism, whether it's bureaucratic or more political, I think is, is really important because I guess one of the things we've learned is that many of the things that um, act as um, agents against loneliness are things that happen already. And connecting people to those programs or perhaps retooling programs, which seems to have been a big part of what they've done in the UK, can have a real impact just by bringing that lens to bear on existing um, on existing uh, projects. The flip side of that, which they've also found in the UK, is that when you shut down um, an institution like a local library, that's a great way to boost loneliness. So having that understanding within government and enabling the bits of government that connect to how people form and maintain their social connections working, that, that's something that I think is important, how it's to be done. I think that's that's a debate we're still to have in in Australia. Do you think there is something in the way that our modern cities are designed that may be exacerbating experiences of loneliness? And is there something we can do to change that? Um, The starting point is to remember, I think, that our cities should be built for people. Um, And to have that at the the forefront of our thinking when we talk about urban design, um, I think Often when we talk about cities, and I'm sure I'm guilty of this too, uh, we think about big bits of infrastructure as ends in themselves, not as means to enable people to, to do the things they want to do or have to do more effectively. I think there's a debate that's going on about recognising that the form, the present form of our cities doesn't respond to some um, immutable law of nature. 
it, it's, it's evolved in response to a series of preferences and, and pressures. And when we apply different um, preferences um, by regulatory means or simply by talking about um, these things in different ways, we can change them. And there's obviously a debate about the extent to which our cities work much, much more effectively for men than for women, as, as one very obvious example. But there's, in the loneliness lens, there's some big picture and small picture questions that I think need to be asked. The first one is, does the form of our dwellings um, encourage people coming together? And if you think about how a lot of suburban housing estates are built, where you drive into your garage and walk from your garage into the living room, well, it's no surprise that many people um, don't know their neighbours or perhaps didn't know their neighbours until the experience of lockdown gave them an opportunity to, to make those connections. Similarly, in the inner city and in apartment buildings, um, there's a debate now which recognises that it's not all that good for people to be in, um, in effectively apartments next door to one another without any meaningful opportunity to congregate and build uh, a sense of community and, and collective belonging. So these small-scale um, debates, I think, are happening. And I think that's been a positive development of the pandemic that people have realised um, the importance of place when, particularly in our city, when, when we've had to spend a large period of time within 5Ks of home. Um, the bigger one is to think about how the city, as I guess, a, a, as a bigger organism, as an economy works and how that can facilitate people um, spending time together incidentally and more easily um, regardless of where they're coming from thinking about how public space works how that public space can be open to more people how leisure facilities um, can work to support people's um, needs for social connection and, and I think libraries are a really big thing in that regard um, not as places where people come once a fortnight to borrow books but where place people come together to um, to do things as, as part of groups based on their interests, the language they, they would prefer to speak sometimes or whatever. And one thing that's really struck me as a local MP, and I suspect I'm not alone, is that we have a need for community space that massively outstrips the supply. We have so many groups in the community, perhaps, again, exacerbated by the time that's been um, spent physically apart. We want to be able to come together in the shared experience their shared uh, language or, or their shared um, cultural or whatever it is interest. When we start to think about social connection being at the, the centre of what a city is all about, it's easy to see how we can redesign and reshape our cities to facilitate that and to address the, the, the challenge that is loneliness in urban populations. When I think about our suburbs, there are actually very few places of public congregation available. Um, you know, for example, in Melbourne, we have Fed Square, but that's only in the city. It's not, there isn't a Fed Square, which is a big sort of public space in the city of Melbourne, for those that aren't familiar with it. There isn't the equivalent of Fed Square in every suburb. And I think, I wonder if what that does is that, that forces us to utilise online spaces as our public square. Twitter becomes the public square. And while there's some good in that, they can also be incredibly toxic places and we don't have the mediating balance of being with other people physically in a public space that, as you said, if it's not built from the beginning, it's very hard to reclaim. You can't suddenly bulldoze 18 houses so we can have a public space in every suburb. So what do we do about that? Yeah, well, that, that's right. Uh, I think it, it's obviously easier to um, to start on good foundations than to, to rebuild. Uh, but I think in some cases the rebuilding is an important part of the story. I think we do need to make sure that there are those places where people can come together. And I, I talked about libraries earlier, and I think having a library um, accessible in all suburbs is, is something that really does matter as, as a space where people can come together. Um, and also recognising that at the different stages in people's lives, people are looking um, to come together in different ways. I mean, there's a big body of evidence out there that, that um, links the number of social groups that we're involved in to um, the quality of our lives, particularly later in life. But simply offering um, 
15 year olds access to ballroom dancing at year 3a at the uh, scout hall at 11 30 in the morning on a tuesday it isn't going to meet the needs i would imagine it's been a long time since i've been a 15 year old for their social connection so understanding that people form relationships differently and on on the point you make about um, online engagement uh, i think it's really well made and I guess I'm also conscious as someone who's closer to 50 than 40 that um, I don't know what it's like to be a digital native and, and I don't presume to speak on behalf of them, but I'm troubled by the evidence that suggests that younger people are lonelier. Um, I am concerned that we don't know enough about how the, the incredible potential of social media where we can connect to people on the most obscure interests around the world easily seems to me to potentially outweigh, to be outweighed rather, by the toxicity that you referred to otherwise. And trying to find a balance there, uh, I think is a, is a huge challenge. It's a challenge for individuals, it's a challenge for parents, but it's a challenge for policymakers as well. David Pearce is the founder of On The Lowdown, an organisation that aims to reduce the stigma surrounding conversations about mental health, especially among men. He believes men are less likely to report feeling lonely, mainly due to social barriers. Hi, I'm David Pierce. I'm the, the founder and the director of On The Lowdown. We are a preventative mental health initiative that connects at-risk people who are less likely to express uh, issues that they are struggling with in re- with regard to their mental health and we connect them to to mental health services. Can you start by telling us about the work that you do around loneliness? This year, I mean, for the last number of years, we've been working pretty hard to connect particularly men uh, to mental health services. So that's a really important thing because men are demonstrating some pretty adverse uh, uh, mental health uh uh, the, the men, men aren't doing that great when it comes to some really, really important metrics as it relates to mental health. So, you know, if you want to look at something like suicide, uh, particularly, which might be the, you know, the, the really, really big one, then you're seeing some really, really significant disparities, statistical disparities between what's happening with women and what's happening with men. So men are, are taking their own lives at a rate of three to four times that as are women. Uh, the, the other thing that they're saying is that men are doing certain things like seeking help a lot less, demonstrating a lot less help-seeking behaviour and also a lot less interdependent decision-making behaviour. And so what that interdependent decision-making is really making decisions in the context of a relationship. And what a lot of all that boils down to is that men aren't demonstrating vulnerability. They're, they're not communicating what's actually going on in their lives to other people, getting other people's perspectives, and then uh, and then actually doing something about it. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, so, so I've been working on the, you know, last couple of years we've been running connection sessions and then this last year we've been working for a lot of different peak health organisations running online mental health events that connect people, break down that stigma. We've been having, you know, uh, Famous celebrities, Steve Monaghetti, uh, Jordan Ruffhead coming along to these events, which has been really, really, uh, really wonderful. And, and, and they talk openly from the heart about mental health and, and all that kind of stuff and, and just sh- demonstrate that it doesn't make you less of a man because, of course, it doesn't make you less of a man to, to, to seek help, you know, uh, to, to talk to other people. It, it makes you more of, of who you are because you become a better resource and, and then bigger and stronger and more wonderful person. If you could wave a magic wand and yeah. change one thing about how we talk to men and about men in terms of their mental health, particularly around loneliness, what would it be? What would you do? I would really like to see a lot less shaming terminology uh, that gets thrown around. It really dissuades men from engaging and entering into the conversation. So I would like to see a, a really supportive and encouraging environment which, uh, which, ta- which leverages from a lot of the really positive characteristics that 
already reside within the traditional male archetype. So, you know, yeah, sure, we've talked about some of the negative, unhealthy characteristics, like you've got to do it all by yourself and, you know, you need, to, you need to be an island and totally independent and don't express yourself emotionally. There's also some really wonderful characteristics like uh, uh, trust or loyalty, um, strength is really, really great. Uh, mateship is a really fantastic thing. So there's there's lots of really positive elements that we can leverage from there. So I think that would be something of my magic wand. In our last episode, Dr. Susie Nielsen, Deputy Director of the Monash University Addiction Research Centre, discussed the links between physical pain, opioid abuse and loneliness. Her research shows that reducing loneliness through social activity interventions can actually help reduce pain. You mentioned how, um, unfortunately, medication is sort of the easiest or most accessible thing to deal with things like chronic pain. Um, I wonder if having better social connections can be something of a mediating force against um, pain. So, for example, if you're a lonely person, and you're experiencing pain, and the two are interconnected in some way, one led, who knows which one led to the other. If you were prescribed a social bonding activity that you actually enjoyed, not something that you had to go to, but that's something that you enjoyed, is there any research on whether that can lessen the effect of physical pain? Absolutely. So this is a really growing area of research around what you've called social prescribing, and that's kind of a the way that that intervention tends to work is you have a social connector who will link people in with a range of activities that they're interested in. And it's often not just saying, here's a list of things you can do. It can be actually going with that person, introducing them, making it, you know, more accessible to go and and seek those activities. Because often, you know, when you're talking about someone who maybe is experiencing depression and has chronic pain, it's not that easy to just get up, get out of the house and go to a place with a group of strangers. So those kinds of social prescribing interventions um, have you know really like a growing amount of research but also a growing amount of evidence to show that they work not only for pain but for a lot of those other complicating factors that I mentioned so things like helping with anxiety or depression in addition to pain so we see this kind of benefit across multiple facets of people's lives which have been challenging and I guess that kind of makes sense because a person is not their depression a person has all of these things going on for them and that social connectedness can benefit them in multiple ways so yeah, I think that's really exciting that we have these solutions. We have a lot of evidence and we have a lot of evidence starting to build that it's not only um, for substance use but also for a range of mental health conditions and for chronic pain that we'll see those benefits. Life course epidemiologist Dr Roseanne freak Poli's research suggests that some interventions can make a difference to an individual's loneliness and overall health. Is there a minimum number of social supports that we know that the average person feels they need to not feel lonely or is it really individual and specific? So at the moment, a lot of the research tends to just to look at people on a scale and look at the highest category versus the lowest category. And that has actually prevented us from prov- providing sort of public health messages around this. I have had a little look at um, numbers and what I have found was that having at least four people that we can either talk to about um, our feelings or uh, ask for help. So if you can do both of those things, they count twice. Um, That's a really great um, number to have around you. And with social um, connections, like physically just going out and going to at least one community event In a month, so going um, to, say, your neighbourhood house and doing a course or um, connecting with at least four people even by telephone a month, these sorts of numbers have had significant effects on your um, benefits to your health. The global loneliness epidemic may not be as headline-grabbing as some other epidemics I could name, but it's just as treacherous. The good news? The policymakers and researchers who are paying attention to it are gaining ground. The better we understand modern loneliness's root causes and its knock-on effects, the better we'll be able to address it and support one another. I had some wonderful interviews with our guest experts on this topic. We've also included some links to their research and initiatives. Take a look. 
Thank you also to the Monash University Performing Arts Centre's David Lee Sound Gallery, where a portion of this season was recorded. If you're enjoying What Happens Next, don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and share the show with your friends. Thanks for joining us. See you next week with an all-new topic.